Let's pray. Uh, bring our needs, uh, bring the cares of a heavy world between uh, us and a big God. Uh, Father in heaven, um, this morning we lift up to you uh, the victims and loved ones of the shooting in Monterey Bay, uh, California, and uh, Father, uh, sometimes we grow numb to these tragedies, and sometimes uh, these, these hit us harder than others uh, for whatever reason, but I don't know that they hit you any less or more hard when they happen. Every life created in your image, precious to you, being your handiwork. And I suspect uh, we, can, we can only gather that there are hundreds, thousands of individuals right now feeling uh, hopeless and, and scared and uh, feeling out of order with the universe. Maybe for the first time they're feeling actually the truth. That we are out of order with the universe. We are out of order with what you have made because we are out of order with you. We pray, Father, that your churches in and around Southern California would rise up and comfort so many hurting souls. Show them the love of Christ. Show them that there is hope in the cross and that there is healing in his blood. Father, for this killer for this murderer who is loose. We pray that you bring him or her to justice. We pray that if any are harboring this person to know who he is or where he is, that they would give this person up. And we pray, Father, not just uh, for justice in this life, because we know that justice in this life is fleeting and imperfect, but we pray, Father, for your perfect justice to be done. And that we have confidence in, and that we thank you, God, because we know that either in eternity or on the cross, your justice will be done. Father, we pray this morning for the Hmong Shua uh, people of China and Vietnam as well. We, we pray, Father, that though there is so little light in that community, so little light among that people group, that you would raise up in their communities gospel light. They are not without any witness, Father, and so we do pray for the Christians there, for the churches there, however scared they may be to be bold in China, to be bold in Vietnam, in those communities, uh, that you would give them the, the strength and endurance and perseverance by your Spirit to preach boldly the gospel of salvation, that many Khmong Shua would would come to know Jesus Christ. Pray, Father, for our own hearts this morning that we would hear your word and believe and make us who are of little faith of a little bit more. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, if you got a Bible, we're going to be in 1 Samuel 20. If you don't have a Bible, you probably pull your phone out and Google search it. Uh, but there are Bibles uh, in the seats in front of you probably, and there's a table of contents if you need to know where 1 Samuel 20 is. We are in a series here at Gateway. 
through most of 1 Samuel. We started in chapter 8 because we did the first seven chapters a couple years ago. Uh, 1 Samuel 20, we're going to be finishing out here right about the time the, uh, the college is let out for the summer. Speaking of which, there are green cards as you go out, and those green cards have a list of upcoming sermons. So grab one of those. Read ahead. Uh, week to week. Read, read what we're going to be studying as we come in. Um, that way the scripture is already on your mind. It's already in your heart before we come together. First Samuel 20, Then David fled from Naioth and Ramah and came and, and, and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my guilt? And what is my sin before your father that he seeks my life? And he said to him, Far from it. You shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, without disclosing it to me. And why should my father hide this from me? It is not so. But David vowed again, saying, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he thinks, Do not let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. And Jonathan said to David, Whatever you say, I will do for you. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I shall not fail to sit at table with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field till the third day at evening. If your father misses me at all, then say, David earnestly asks leave of me to run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice there for all the clan. If he says, Good, it will be well with your servant, but if he is angry, then know that harm is determined by him. Therefore, deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of the Lord with you. But if there is guilt in me, kill me yourself. For why should you bring me to your father? And Jonathan said, Far be it from you. If I knew that it was determined by my father that harm should come to you, would I not tell you? Then David said to Jonathan, who will tell me if your father answers you roughly? And Jonathan said to David, come, let us go out into the field. So they both went out into the field. And Jonathan said to David, the Lord, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded out my father about this time tomorrow or the third day, behold, if he is well disposed toward David, shall I not then send and disclose it to you? But it should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do so to Jonathan and more also, if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. May the Lord be with you as he has been with my father. If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die, and do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth, and Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. And Jonathan made David swear again by his love for him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed because your seat will be empty. On the third day, go down quickly to the place where you hid yourself when the matter was in hand, and remain beside the stone heap. And I will shoot three arrows to the side of it, as though I shot at a mark. And behold, I will send a boy saying, go find the arrows. If I say to the boy, look, the arrows are on this side of you, take them, then you are to come for the Lord. For as the Lord lives, it is safe for you, and there is no danger. But if I say to the youth, look, the arrows are beyond you, then go, for the Lord has sent you away. And as for the matter of which you and I have spoken, behold, the Lord is between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field. And when the new moon came, the king sat down to eat food. The king sat at his table, at, as at other times, on the seat by the wall. Jonathan sat opposite, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Yet Saul did not say anything that day, for he thought, something has happened to him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. 
But on the second day, the day after the new moon, David's place was empty. And Saul said to Jonathan, his son, why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal, either yesterday or today? But Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, let me go, for our clan holds a sacrifice in the city, and my brother has commanded me to be there. So now, if I have found favor in your eyes, let me get away and see my brothers. For this reason, he has not come to the king's table. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. Therefore send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Then Jonathan answered Saul, his father, why should he be put to death? What has he done? But Saul hurled his spear at him to strike him. So Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. And Jonathan rose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had disgraced him. In the morning, Jonathan went out into the field to the appointment with David and with him a little boy. And he said to his boy, run and find the arrows that I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. And when the boy came to the place of the arrow that Jonathan had shot, Jonathan called after the boy and said, is not the arrow beyond you? And Jonathan called after the boy, hurry, be quick, do not stay. So Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the boy knew nothing. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. And Jonathan gave his weapons to the boy and said to him, go and carry them into the city. And as soon as the boy had gone, David rose from behind, beside the stone heap, fell on his face to the ground and bowed three times. And they kissed one another and wept with one another, David weeping the most. Then Jonathan said to David, go in peace, because we have sworn, both of us, in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord shall be between me and you, and between my offspring and your offspring forever. And he rose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. It's a little bit longer passage than we've had in some of the sermons in this series. What do you do when you're forced to choose? And I'm not talking about um, what you want to eat for dinner, although I understand that can be a monumental undertaking for some of us. I get that. Um, I know the feeling of being chronically indecisive about inconsequential matters. And I'm talking about being forced to make a choice that is ultimately life-altering. I'm talking about the, the, the kinds of choices in, in which you have to give up something you've held on to, something that is precious to you, something that had real value, whether money or a relationship or just an image, an idea you had of yourself. And you have to give that up in order to have something else. It's one or the other. It can't be both. It might be neither if, if you prolong making the choice. Have you ever noticed that when you, when you have to make these sort of life-altering decisions, if we try to avoid them or we try to prolong making them, maybe out of stubbornness or analysis paralysis, we can end up missing both options? Sometimes in life, we have to turn our back on one thing to take hold of something else. Last week, we, we looked at a passage in which some loyalties were, were strained. In chapter 19, Jonathan and Michal, two of King Saul's children, were put in a position where their relationships with their father and with David, the son of Jesse, were in conflict. David was the close friend of Jonathan the king's son, and he's the husband of Michal, the king's daughter. And the passage wasn't fundamentally about the strains on those relationships, but it, was, it wasn't exactly in the background either. And in the end, both Jonathan and, and Michal found ways to stay in favor with their father while doing the right thing by David. But in chapter 20, Jonathan isn't going to have that option anymore. He's going to have to make a hard choice. 
And how and why he makes that choice, I think, has grave importance for us listening today. And we'll examine how that decision unfolds through four scenes and then apply that truth to our lives. And we'll apply a little bit as we go, but the main application is, I'm going to say for the end. Like I said, there's kind of four scenes in this passage. We're going to walk through them. Last week, we saw how, the, how first the king's son, Jonathan, and then David's daughter, or David's spouse, Michal, the king's daughter, and then the Holy Spirit himself were used to sustain David, God's servant, amidst his suffering. And, and we noted that God does not promise a life without suffering, but he does promise to sustain his servants in their suffering multiple times. In fact, Saul attempted to kill David several times after Jonathan talked him out of it. And he had given his son Jonathan his assurance that he would never do such a thing. And that's sort of what sets the stage for this passage. So, so David has been on the back end of some further death threats. And he comes back to the capital to speak to Jonathan. And he wants to know what he possibly could have done to deserve this treatment from the king, from Jonathan's dad. Had he done anything wrong? And his language is incredulous. He really doesn't think he has done anything wrong, but he's also earnest. I think we get that sense from David. If he has done something wrong, he does want to own it. Now, Jonathan, for his part, does not believe it. Jonathan does not know that his father hurled his spear a couple more times at David. He does not know that his father traveled to Ramah to kill David. And he does not believe his dad would do such a thing after giving him his word that he wouldn't. He believes that he has his dad's complete trust. But David counters with the fact that your dad knows that we're close. And your dad wouldn't want to upset you, Jonathan. That's exactly the kind of thing your dad would hide from you. Jonathan doesn't want to believe that his father could have betrayed his trust. He doesn't want to believe that his father could be a cold-hearted murderer. I mean, that's a lot to take in. That's life-changing information. Uh, To accept that information on any level would be to forever change his opinion of his father and, and probably on some level to forever change his opinion of who he himself is. He's the son of that man. That changes things. The difficulty for Jonathan comes from the fact that back in chapter 18, David and Jonathan had made a covenant. That means they had pledged a mutual loyalty to each other. So Jonathan can't simply acknowledge that his dad tried to kill David. As hard as that would be on its own, he has an obligation to protect David, to look out for David. And that would mean that he's responsible to actively interfere with his father's plans. And so a neutral position toward his dad is out of the question here. If David's assumption, his intuition, his report is correct, Jonathan is in a situation where he has to make a decision that is going to change his loyalties, change his life forever. Now, whether it's understandable that Jonathan shouldn't believe this report, it's certainly understandable that he doesn't want to believe this report. Like I said, it's life-changing. And I think many of us, maybe all of us, can at least sympathize with Jonathan's dilemma. The old saying, ignorance is bliss, was made for times like this. The longer Jonathan can just pretend to be in the dark, the happier he can go about his life. But Jonathan and David are not going to stay ignorant. Jonathan said to David, whatever you say, I will do for you. So David hatches a plan. It's a new month, it's a new moon, and that means there will be a traditional 
start of the month sacrifice. It seems like at this time, since there wasn't a central place of worship yet, they weren't all going to Jerusalem yet, that was much later, these sacrifices were done with the family, or they were done in their hometowns. And, and David, as the king's son-in-law, and a member of the king's court, would have been expected to be part of those celebrations at the capital at the king's table. And he figures that if he doesn't show up, even after these death threats, the king will wonder where he is. And Jonathan, Jonathan, the plan is, will tell a little lie that David went home to be with family in Bethlehem. And if the king is okay with that, then they'll assume they've either misread the situation or his anger has calmed down. But if the king is furious, they'll know he intends to harm David. And then David gets personal, uh, beginning in verse 8. He reminds Jonathan of their covenant. And he asks him to treat him kindly. By which he means he's pleading with him to make good on this request. And what's more, if Jonathan finds out that David has done anything wrong, if he's done anything, if he's committed any sin, he asks that Jonathan will kill him himself rather than take him to his father to do it. Jonathan assures David that he would tell him. He would tell him if his father intended to kill him. And so David asks the practical question, how will you let me know? And Jonathan invites him out to the fields. Now, our passage is not fundamentally about decision-making, but it is the backdrop of our passage, so, so, so let's not ignore it. And fundamental to making a life-altering decision is finding out the answer to the question, what is true? And I do think many of us stumble right out of the gate on this one because... We don't even want to ask that question because the answer to that question can be scary. What is true? David has a pretty good idea of what's true. King Saul wants to kill him. Jonathan's a little bit more unsure. But either way, they're going to ask the tough question. And they're going to make a decision based on the answer. But sometimes asking the question, what is true, is the hardest step because it's so much easier to try to stay ignorant what is true the scene shifts to the field jonathan's words let let us go into the field are, are, are strikingly similar to the words that cain spoke to his brother abel Remember, Cain took Abel out to the field to kill him. But Jonathan is taking taking David to the field to preserve his life. You know, a number of years later, David's son, Solomon, would, would record in the book of Proverbs, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Jonathan was that sort of friend. And once the two are in the field, Jonathan wants to establish something. He takes an oath. He swears to tell David if his dad is going to harm him. He promises that's going to be the case. He says, but should it please my father to do you harm, the Lord do to Jonathan, and more also if I do not disclose it to you and send you away, that you may go in safety. But then Jonathan asks for something in verse 14. He says, if I am still alive, which that's ominous, isn't it? If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love of the Lord that I may not die. So Jonathan understands that what he's doing has consequences. He's potentially coming between his father and David. And if David's right, this might not go well for Jonathan. But he goes further in the next verse. He says, And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever when the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. And Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord take vengeance on David's enemies. Jonathan seems to understand that the Lord is with David. That's been a theme since David was introduced in this book. 
God is with David. And whether Jonathan understands yet that David will be king, he seems to get it. But whether he knows it for sure or not, he, he seems to know it's a possibility. And if Saul has become David's enemy, and God is with David, then Saul is God's enemy. And Jonathan wants no part of that. And so Jonathan makes a covenant with the house of David. In chapter 18, Jonathan made a covenant with David as an individual. This covenant is with David's house, his family, his descendants. It's a binding covenant that extends into the future. And so in verses 18 and 19, Jonathan tells David he'll be missed. He'll be missed at this new moon festivities. But he'll get the necessary information So go hide by the stone heap in the field on the third day. And then he'll pretend to go out and do a little target practice with his bow and arrows. He'll shoot a handful of arrows, send a servant to get them, and based on whether he thinks his dad is out to kill David or not, he'll yell out either one set of directions or another set of directions for David to hear. And in that way, David will know whether he's safe to come home or he needs to run away. By the way, if you're wondering, if you, you don't care, you don't care. But I was wondering, I was curious, so maybe you are too. When I, look on the, when I look on a calendar, I see that the new moon is one day, right? You look on a calendar, full moon's here, new moon's here, right? And the new moon is the opposite of the full moon. It, it, it's when the moon is completely in the earth's shadow, right? And, and so it's completely dark in the sky, but they're celebrating for two days in this passage. Even though on my calendar, it's one day. So here's why. From an astronomical perspective, the new moon is an instant in time, right? There is an instant in which the moon is completely in the earth's shadow. An instant. In Cleveland, that was roughly 8.53 p.m. last night. If you looked up at 11 p.m. last night, technically, technically, a part of the moon was out of the Earth's shadow, and there was a tiny, tiny crescent, but you couldn't see it. It's too small. As far as the naked eye is concerned, the moon was dark all night. As far as the naked eye is concerned, the time between when a human can see the last sliver of light at the end of the lunar cycle and the first sliver of light at the beginning of the new cycle, well, sometimes that can stretch across two nights. And apparently the ancient Israelites celebrated for two nights on those occasions. So, neat, huh? Anyhow, this has been your episode of Cosmos with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, Moving on. Uh, Anyhow, as for Jonathan and David, they have their plan to find out about King Saul's intentions. And they have a plan to convert, covertly communicate those intentions to David once the monthly celebrations have passed. And that's worth noting. They need to know what is true, so they make a plan to find out. They aren't going to allow ignorance to be their bliss. They have a plan. We've established that. But they're also prepared for the worst. If the truth leads them into a dark place, and make no mistake, sometimes truth leads us into dark places, they were prepared. They were prepared two ways. They were prepared to get David out safely, but Jonathan also took steps to secure his future and his family's future so that if David ever had to come after Saul's family... Jonathan would not be a part of that. And those of you who know the rest of the story know that that very much comes true. After David is finally recognized as the king of Israel, and that story plays out over many chapters in the book of 2 Samuel, David looks for ways to show loyalty and faithfulness and love to the descendants of Jonathan. So Jonathan's preparation will eventually pay off. 
So when facing life-altering decisions, we make preparations, or we ought to make preparations for the worst parts of the possible outcomes. We don't want to ignore them. So the scene shifts again, this time to the festivities, and as expected, everyone's there except David. We might wonder why Saul would have expected David to show up with all the killing and whatnot, tends to dissuade the party guests. I imagine there's a lot of things going on. For one thing, he's the king. He's used to getting what he wants. For another, he's attempted to kill David in the past, and David just kind of dutifully continued to serve him because David just kind of was like that. Um, and so he might have thought that David would return to serve him just like before. And for another thing, Saul just seems to be that dense that he doesn't appreciate how his actions affect others. We might note that about abusive and narcissistic people, that they often act that way. But whatever the case, Saul did expect his son-in-law to be back for the sacrifices, and he wasn't there. And, And for the first night, Saul reasoned that David who was generally a rather devout and pious Jewish young man, may have become ritually unclean. Uh, There's many reasons a person could become ritually unclean under Jewish law. One of them might be just touching a dead body. If you touch a dead body, then you can't attend the sacrifices. That would have been easy for someone like David, who was a warrior, who's out doing battle, or just an accident. You You run into your neighbor. People died young back then. For any number of reasons, though, you could have wound up just being accidentally unclean. You had to go through a ritual process to cleanse yourself, and by the next day, you would be clean. And so Saul figures that's probably what happened. It was common enough at the time for a person to be unclean. But when David doesn't show up the next night, then Saul knows something's wrong here. So then he asks Jonathan, why has not the son of Jesse come to the meal either yesterday or today? Jonathan's ready for that, and he, and he feeds his dad the lie that he and David had planned. David's brother had asked him to come home to Bethlehem for the feast. David asked Jonathan permission. for permission. Jonathan told David it was okay to go, and Saul is livid. He calls Jonathan a son of a perverse, rebellious woman, and, and that translation really doesn't do justice to what Saul is saying. You can use your imagination. Uh, this is one of those places where The Bible is actually pretty raw, but our modern sensibilities suggest that we can't be raw in a spiritual setting, so we we mute it. We mute it a bit. But Saul's words are very harsh. It's not that Saul doesn't believe Jonathan. He probably does, but he also, A, wants to kill kill David. B, thinks Jonathan knows it. And C, thinks Jonathan is protecting David one way or another. And he also thinks Jonathan's a fool. When he says, for as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, neither you nor your kingdom shall be established. What he's basically telling Jonathan is that David is the greatest threat to Jonathan inheriting the throne. Saul knows that David is the one God has chosen to be king. He knows it. He's telling Jonathan that if if he wants the riches and the glory and the goods of the kingdom, then his greatest interest is in siding with his father and destroying David. Because if he sides with David, he's not going to get any of that. Jonathan asks, why should he be put to death? What has he done? He's echoing David's question to him at the beginning of the chapter, but he's also seeking another piece of information. He knows that dad wants to kill David, but that's not the end of it, is it? Because if his dad has a good reason to kill David, if David has committed any sort of crime worthy of death, then Jonathan needs to know that fact because David has asked Jonathan to kill him if he's done anything like that. But Saul's only answer is to hurl his spear at his own son. The way he had thrown it at David several times before. In a way, Saul's actions tell us what we already know. Jonathan 
was siding with David. Jonathan was one with David. And so Jonathan leaves. And in leaving, Jonathan's making a choice, isn't he? He's making a decision. He now knows the truth. His father intends to kill David. His father even makes an attempt to kill him for defending David too strongly. The truth is in the open. And so he can't sit on that fact. He makes a decision. It's clear that he has to support David now. And that takes us to our final seat. Jonathan goes to the the field the next day, and he has a little target practice. He gives the verbal cue to the boy who is with him to tell David that Saul is, in fact, out to kill him, and he sends the boy home. And that's a reminder that Jonathan's decision could not merely be an intellectual one. He could not just say in his head, all right, I'm going to follow David. I'm going to support David. I'm on David's side, not my dad's side. I like, I like David better than my dad. My, David, my dad is a real jerk. I'm going to follow David. No. His decision required clear and resolute action. Even though there was risk in being found out, Life-altering decisions must be made with both our heads and our hands, our attitudes and our actions. There has to be motion. Can't be just up here. But something unexpected happens, doesn't it? David gets out of his hiding place. He's supposed to just flee, right? He's supposed to hear the, the, the word from Jonathan, that my dad's out to get you, in, you know, in coded language, my dad's out to get you and just flee. But he can't. He comes out of his hiding place. And he bows three times before Jonathan in, in honor and respect. It really throws off the whole covert operation, everything they've planned this entire chapter. All the work at secret communication is done away with if if David's just going to come out of the hiding place and into the open. But it it seems like this this true bond of friendship the men shared could not keep them apart. They kiss each other, which was not strange in their culture, and they weep. And Jonathan tells him to get out of town. And and on the way out, he reminds them of their covenant, not just between them as men, but between their families. And they go their separate ways. And the response reminds us these life-altering decisions, it's okay, it's normal, it's even maybe good that they come with intense emotions. Jonathan had a permanently damaged relationship with his father. And, And though his relationship with David was probably never stronger than in that moment, he also didn't know if he'd ever see David again. And so it was a bitter day. And as for David, it was his last hope at a normal life. It was gone. I mean, he was pretty convinced of this fact at the beginning of the chapter, but now he knew it was true. There was no going back. He was leaving his wife. He was leaving his best friend. He was leaving his career. He probably couldn't even go back to his hometown without jeopardizing his family. So it's no wonder it is the last we have heard of Bethlehem in this book. It is a bitter day for David, too. Life-changing decisions are marked by action, and they are marked by real emotion. That's okay. So life-altering decisions should be based on truth. If you don't know the truth, you need to plan to find out the truth. Once you know the truth, you need to make a decision. And once you make a decision, you need to put that decision into action. And it's okay, it's right even to be emotional over it. There will be likely be reasons, both good and bad, to weep. That's just good advice. That's just, that's just wisdom. That's wisdom I think we can derive from the life of Jonathan and from the life of David. But there's something more here. Jonathan wasn't 
making just any life-changing decision. He was making a decision about who would be king. Now, flatly put, on some obvious level, Jonathan had no say in that. Like, who, who is king is the king, right? The king is the king. No one chooses the king. That's the whole idea of how kings work. But we choose whom we honor as king, right? I mean, part of the reason why the king of England is a joke is that he has no real power, he has no real authority, and he commends very little respect in his personal affairs. So even in Great Britain, like a quarter of the population in a recent survey dislike the man, dislike him, not even neutral, dislike the man. And less than half of younger Britons even think there should be a monarchy. But each Briton can decide to honor Charles as king or not. They, don't, they can't really choose whether he is king, but they can choose whether they honor him as king or not. And it seems like the majority don't. But hey, that's them. Glad to be an American. But Jonathan's loyalties were put to the test in a way that he could not avoid. He could be absolutely loyal to his father, who was king, or he could be absolutely loyal to David, but he could not be absolutely loyal to both. His father was king by name. And his father could promise him the riches of the kingdom, the power and the fame of inheriting the kingdom as heir to the throne. On the other hand, there was the truth. There was the truth that Jonathan had offered his loyalty to David. There was the truth that David had done nothing wrong. There was the truth that his father was unjustly trying to kill David. And ultimately, there was the truth that God had anointed David to be king in place of his father. Who would Jonathan honor as king? Saul or David? And really, in in choosing Saul, there was a sense in which Jonathan was choosing himself as the heir apparent. Am I the king of my kingdom? Or is David? Throwing in his lot with David might mean giving up everything the world had to offer. It might cost Jonathan dearly. But it was a decision based on truth. David was the Lord's anointed. Hebrew word for that is shiach. Messiah. And God would eventually promise David an eternal throne, that one of his descendants would reign forever. And in time that descendant would be born, his name was Jesus, another baby born in Bethlehem. He came with good news that the kingdom was near. And he was that king. He was a king in the line of David. But he was a king who was far superior to David. David was a righteous man, but David was a sinner. And he's going to prove to be a sinner if you know the story of David. He is a very imperfect man. He looks like a saint next to, next to Saul, but he has his flaws. But Jesus lived a life of perfect obedience. David was a man of war, but Jesus was a man of peace. David saved his people by taking blood, but Jesus saved his people by offering his own blood. As a perfect man, without sin, Jesus died in the place of sinners. He defeated sin, and he defeated death so that those who rally around his victory in faith can get in on the spoils of that, forgiveness, of that victory, forgiveness from sin and eternal life. That is good news. 
Jonathan, in his own way, made that call. He knew that God had chosen David, and he'd rather be on God's side with God's promises, no matter how much he had to give up, than to have the promises of a rejected king and a rejected father named Saul. And we are all called to make a similar life-changing decision. What to do with the Lord's anointed, the Lord's Messiah, with Jesus. It's an absolutely life-altering decision, so you, you should not make it lightly. And, and that goes a couple different ways. But you do have to ask yourself, what is true? It does start there. If Jesus is the Messiah, if Jesus is the King of Kings who died for the sins of the world on a Roman cross some 2,000 years ago, and if Jesus rose from the dead because he won the victory over sin and death, then that matters. That changes everything. Now, if that's not true, you can continue to be the king of your own little kingdom. You can continue to honor yourself as the sole master of your life. And you can look forward to whatever riches the world has to offer. But if that's true, then there will be a reckoning because he's king and you're not. And you can either honor him as king now or recognize that he's king too late. If that's true, it's a hard thing to ignore. But make no mistake, some people tried. Jonathan tried. We saw this in chapter 19. Jonathan tried to hold on to his loyalty to David and his loyalty to his father. He couldn't. It worked for a little while. But eventually you will be loyal to one, loyal to the other, or neither. You cannot serve both you and Jesus. You can't serve both your career and Jesus. You can't serve sex and Jesus. You can't serve alcohol and Jesus. You can't serve money and Jesus. You name it and Jesus, you can't serve them both. It will come to an inflection point and you will need to decide who is what is your king? You need to make a plan to figure out what the truth is if you're not sure. If you're not sure whether that is true, then you need to make a plan. Because if that's true, it matters. And, and sinning in the, the ignorance of the blissfulness of ignorance is, is not a great plan. It just feels good for a little while to, to put off the anxiety for a better day. A better day that never comes. You need to make a plan. Life and death are in the balance. You cannot let this go. Do not sit around. Jonathan and David had a plan to find out the truth because they were unsure. We should do no less. I'd love to sit down with you and tell you why I'm sure. I can, I can lead you to good books. I can lead you to good arguments. There are others here in this church that can do the same. Many, I'm sure, who can do it better than I can. But don't sit on this. Ignorance is not really bliss. It just feels like it for a while. Make a plan to find the truth. And once you know the truth, decide. And once you decide, you need to act on it. And this is, and this is where I see some people who call themselves Christians get tripped up. Because they think they can leave their decision in intellectual space, in heart space. But you need to take decisive action. The Bible speaks of faith and speaks of repentance. It's sort of two sides of the same coin. Faith is, is the, the intellectual, heartfelt commitment. Repentance is the change that is produced by such a commitment. And if you don't have one, you don't, if you don't have the repentance, then you don't really have the right kind of intellectual commitment that the Bible is talking about when it speaks of faith. 
You need to take decisive action, and that means giving something up. There are things this world offers that will no longer be on the table for you. There may be people who walk away from you. There will be things you didn't even expect to lose that you will lose. But there will be things you gain. A new family, a new community, eternal life, all the riches in the eternal kingdom, and all the inestimable riches of truth itself. When I first came to the realization that this stuff was true, I had a decision to make. I just remember laying in my bed one night thinking to myself, this is true. And I just remember thinking to myself, yeah, but this is not going to go over well with these people. This is, is going to be a tough situation. If I do this Jesus thing, this is, this is, this is going to be heavy. And I remember thinking to myself, but yeah, but if it's true, why would I want to live any other way? Whatever it costs me, I want to live by what's true. I don't want to live with my head in the sand, pretend like it's not true just because it's more convenient for me, because it's easier for me. But make no mistake, you'll leave something behind. Jesus taught his disciples, truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now and this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. So be it. And it's okay to weep. It's okay to weep. I don't think you'll weep over much. The promises of Jesus' kingdom are so much greater than the promises of the kingdom of this world, but notice Jonathan didn't weep over losing the kingdom. Jonathan didn't weep over losing his dad. He wept over losing proximity with David. Jesus' disciples despaired when he was crucified. And they rejoiced when he rose from the dead. And when he ascended to heaven, they may have been saddened. They missed him, but Jesus promised that he would be with them always. How? Well, Jesus said when he left, he would send them a helper. In some translations, it's a a counselor or a comforter who was the Holy Spirit to be with them. And so we Christians, though we have times when we long to see our king, and it's okay to weep because we love our king, we have a comforter. The Apostle Paul, as he neared the end of his life, wrote to his friend Timothy, Finally, the crown of righteousness is reserved for me. The Lord, the righteous judge, will award it to me in that day. And not only me, but also to all who have set their affection on his appearing. But it's okay to weep. Not the evils that we give up, but but sometimes the relationships they signify, yeah. It's okay for Jonathan to grieve that Saul does not recognize the true king. It's okay for Jonathan to grieve that his dad could not celebrate David with him. It's okay for Jonathan to grieve that that meant his relationship with his dad was going to be strained. That was sad. Life-altering decisions are emotional ones, and it's okay to grieve them. Then, then we move on. Then we move on because the decision has consequences. And so Jonathan grieves and he goes back into the city. He goes back into the city with newly solidified loyalties. He couldn't stay in the field grieving. He can't stay there. And so we follow Jesus. We who follow Jesus go back into the world with our newly solidified loyalties to the king of kings and that's how we live let's pray
Father, we uh, make us resolute, God. Make us sure. Do not let us be people who try to casually follow you, but may we be people who know the truth, that we seek out the truth, and then we decide full-throatedly to commit ourselves to it and act on that knowledge that we move in faith and repentance. May we truly be people of a new heart. And we pray for those who have not yet come to that point of decision that they would do so now, soon, quickly. And come, Lord Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing one more time uh, to 